Good evening, everyone. And welcome to Cover Cropping in the Canadian Prairies. My name is Mary Jane Orr, and I'm the General Manager for Manitoba Beef and Forage Initiatives. MBFI is a research and demonstration farm with two farm stations located in Western Manitoba, where our mission is to advance Manitoba beef and forage industry by engaging stakeholders, evaluating on-farm innovation and extension for sustainability of farmers, the public and the environment. MBFI had its first field season in 2015, and it was made possible through the collaborative partnership with um, four organizations in Manitoba, the Manitoba Beef Producers, Ducks Unlimited Canada, Manitoba Forage and Grasslands Association, and the Department of Manitoba Agriculture through uh, strategic grant funding of Growing Forward to initially, and then uh, currently with the Canadian Agricultural Partnership. And I would like to start off uh, this evening by acknowledging the incredible value of the survey data that um, and would like to commend Callum on his fantastic work in engaging a broad and wide swath of agriculture across the prairies to increase our understanding of how cover crops are working in our environment. Um, Callum, who's our primary presenter this evening, is currently a graduate student at the University of Manitoba and an excellent social media promoter. Uh, Callum has received his uh, bachelor degree in science from Scotland's Rural College and his master's in sustainable plant health from the University of Edinburgh. Callum has a clear love of agriculture as well as enjoying working in his yard with his dog, Bobby. We also have Virginia Jansen joining us to moderate the question and answer following Callum's presentation. And Virginia is also a graduate student uh, working on her master's with a focus on cover crop agronomy at the University of Manitoba. And both Callum and Virginia have the fantastic opportunity um, to have Dr. Yvonne Molly as a mentor and as an advisor. Um, and Yvonne is joining us this evening as well. Yvonne is an assistant professor in plant science, in the, sorry, plant science department at the University of Manitoba. Her research takes place on both the small plot scale as well as on-farm field scale, where she studies agronomy and cropping systems. Dr. Lolly's research has focused on several crops, including soybeans, corn, wheat, uh, with a wide range of management practices, such as residue management, strip tillage, and of course, cover crops. Uh, just general housekeeping for this evening. Uh, please post any questions you have in the Q&A box. So as you look along the bottom of your screen, uh, you'll see a Q&A uh, panel that will pop up, but then you'll also see a chat panel that will pop up. So please put questions that you would like to have addressed at the end of the session in the Q&A box, and then any comments or, um, uh, yeah, any comments that you have just in general, you can put in the chat feature for discussion. Um, but otherwise, with no further ado, I will hand off to Callum, and I look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Mary Jane, and thank you very much for, uh, to Manitoba Beef and Forages Initiative for uh, hosting this uh, webinar. Um, so um, we've heard um, now who myself is and who my professor and Virginia is and Mary Jane is. So now we want to find a little bit about uh, who you are. So I'm going to start a little poll here and uh, you should see it appearing on your screen now. Really, we would love to know where you're from. Are you from uh, the uh, Canadian prairies, uh, other parts of Canada, the United States, or even further abroad? Um, you know, uh, how would you describe your farm type? Um, what experience do you have with cover crops? And also, if you participated in the um, 2020 Prairie Cover Crop Survey. So I'm just going to wait now until um, you've responded to this. And uh, I would encourage you to, uh, as you watch this uh, presentation, if you see, um, if you want to leave a question for us to be answered at the end, I'll just remind you, put that in the Q&A. And if you have any comments, you can leave that in uh, the chat. Wow, you're really, uh, <laughs> really rolling in here. So that's fantastic. Great. Fantastic. 127 people already answered. So 
we'll just wait uh, wait uh, a little bit longer. Eighty one percent of people have completed. This will just give us a good idea as to uh, who I'm talking to, and I can maybe tailor some of my responses. It's <laughs> still coming in fast. Uh, um, I'll wait until uh, we have 10 more seconds until it's been going for two minutes, and then I'll close it. So when I end poll, you'll be able to see this on your screens. OK, so I'm going to share results. So you can scroll down. So unsurprisingly, most uh, of our participants are from the three prairie provinces, with uh, the most from Manitoba, then Saskatchewan and Alberta. Um, we also have a number of people from other parts of Canada and to the United States. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, most people are livestock farmers. That's quite similar to our results as we'll get into later. We also have a number of farmers who are grain farmers, but you can see many different types of farmers have taken part. Interestingly, only 9% of our, uh, the people responded said they're organic, but uh, uh, we have a number of them. And lo let's look at the experience. So that is very exciting. A number of farmers want to try growing cover crops, but they never have. Um, but we do have some people with uh, quite a bit of experience, but most people at the beginning of their journey with cover crops. And that's what I like to see. 84% of the people say they've uh, taken, uh, taken the 2020 survey. So we welcome that new 16% as well for finding out what we're doing in our project. So without further ado, I'll stop sharing that and we can get going with our, um, with our uh, talk. So, my talk is called Cover Cropping on the Canadian Prairies. So, first of all, I'm going to give you a little overview of today's talk. So, first of all, we're going to define what are cover crops, and then we're going to uh, discuss why do we actually believe uh, research needed to be done. Then we'll have a look at the results. So, a look at the farms that took part in our survey and what agronomy they're using to actually put these, um, uh, integrate these cover crops onto the, uh, on the prairies. We'll have a look at the benefits that these farmers have seen since growing cover crops and what time scale they've seen these benefits. And then the most common problems that these farmers have faced. And then we'll have a look um, at how we can potentially enable adoption of cover crops on the prairies, and then we'll give you a chance to um, ask some questions uh, that myself and uh, Dr. Von Lawley uh, can answer. So first of all, let's just define what a cover crop is. So a cover crop is a non-cash crop, which is grown um, to provide cover when the soil would otherwise be left bare. And on the prairies, these take two major forms, either a shoulder season cover crop, which is grown to, uh, grown to provide benefits in that shoulder season after the harvest of one cover crop and the planting of the next cover crop. Um, a shoulder season cover crop can actually be started as an intercrop while the cash crop is still growing. So either planted um, at the same time as the cash crop or um, planted at any time uh, during that cash crop growing season. But as I say, they can also be planted after that cash crop entirely. And then you have the full season cover crops, which um, are pretty much, uh, it's uh, exactly what they are. They're grown over the entirety of the growing season. It can be grown for a number of different reasons. For example, as a green manure by organic farmers um, to uh, try and manage problem soils, to combat salinity. And um, our definition of cover crops does include cover crops that uh, are grazed. So why might a farmer grow cover crops? Now, this is a decision which is very much down to farm specific goals, which uh, farmers have uh, for themselves. Um, we like to think of cover crops as a bit as a toolbox. So each different cover crop has um, different um, 
some things they're very good at, some things they're not so good at. And a farmer will look at what, uh, what they want to achieve and then select um, a cover crop that will help best meet their goals and can fit into their, um, uh, uh, their farming system. So um, some uh, reasons why farms may grow a cover crop are to improve soil health. And um, some of the attributes of that would be to feed soil biology. Cover crops uh, produce root exudates, which really feed those hungry soil microbes at a time when they otherwise go hungry. Uh, we can help build soil organic matter, which is a great benefit, um, and also improve soil aggregation, and then by extension, um, water infiltration into our soils. Um, but cover crops also, they cover the soil, which can help protect against soil and wind erosion, which historically was a major problem in the Canadian prairies. Um, some cover crops, which um, uh, such as legumes, so peas and beans, which take nitrogen out to the atmosphere with the aid of rhizobium bacteria and put it into the soil um, for subsequent cash crops to use. Um, so uh, Cover crops can help build soil nitrogen. Some cover crops as well have the ability to scavenge excess nitrogen that's left on the field, uh, particularly cereal cover crops and grasses. And then many cover crops also have the ability to suppress weeds. So these are just a few of the reasons why farmers may choose to grow a cover crop. So cover cropping on the prairies, let's talk about what the situation is. So obviously I'm sure most of you know on the prairies, uh, we do have a much shorter growing season than farmers say in eastern Canada, particularly Ontario, as well as uh, even just a few miles south in uh, uh, North Dakota, Minnesota, um, these growing seasons. So because of that, a lot of farmers on the prairies have been historically skeptical about uh, the use of cover crops because we have um, sometimes a much shorter window um, that we are, we are working with up here. And again, in the fall, there's quite often a shortage of moisture, um, particularly as we move to into Saskatchewan and Alberta. So because of this, um, there's only really a, a small number of enthusiastic early adopters on the prairies. However, every year, these adopters uh, and other interested farmers are hearing success stories coming out of um, Ontario and the northern United States. And more and more farmers are thinking, how can we integrate cover crops onto the prairies? And um, these farmers, uh, we could really benefit from learning how these farmers have integrated cover crops onto their farms. And um, that would benefit, um, really put to rest some of the fears that um, farmers may have about growing cover crops. And uh, so anyway, here's our project objectives. So we really wanted to find out what is the extent of cover cropping on the prairies, how cover crops are being used, why farmers are using cover crops, what benefits farmers have experienced, what problems farms have experienced, and what could be done to enable uh, prairie farms growing cover crops on the prairies. So our survey ran between October 2020 to April 2021. So farms across Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba were invited to take part in our survey and were asked questions about farm type and size, what cover crops they grew, how they were growing these cover crops, how were they integrating them into their prairie farms, what benefits they'd seen and, uh, and in what time scale they'd seen these benefits and what problems they'd faced. And then we asked them a, few, a question about how we may be able to enable cover crop use. Farms were also invited to take part in our survey. They did not grow a cover crop in 2020, but that's, uh, we won't be discussing that today. Um, so how did we actually reach out to all these farmers? Now, we decided that we would reach out to farmers in as many different ways as possible. Um, one of the major ways we did this is we made use of farmers who'd taken part in an early survey um, that uh, asked farmers about the 2019 uh, survey 
So 211 farmers took part in our 2019 survey across the four, uh, three prairie provinces. We sent that out and um, many of them responded straight away. We also used extensive use of social media. Um, many posts were made on uh, either local Facebook groups or um, farming Facebook groups, as well as on Twitter. And um, that was a very dynamic and interesting experience that we got. I got to hear, talk directly to many farmers across the prairies. And a lot of farmers were very happy to uh, share um, what we were doing with other farmers. Um, it was a very organic and um, engaging experience. We also engaged with uh, both agricultural and local media. Um, we were in dozens of newspapers and magazines across the prairies. We were also on the radio, we did podcasts, and we even made it onto the television. And I also reached out to dozens of farm organizations across the provinces so that we could really ensure that we were really accurately trying to represent um, what was happening on the prairies and we didn't uh, miss out any types of farmers. So, our results. So 281 farmers that grew cover crops in 2020 took part in our research, and that is just phenomenal. Um, that is a, a large number of farmers to take part when this wasn't paid. Um, so this just shows how interested these farmers really were in our research and really wanted to help us um, tell the story of cover cropping on the prairies. So 81% of the farmers that took part told us that they grew a full season cover crop and 47% of farms that took part told us that they grew a shoulder season cover crop. And these farmers grew over 102,000 acres of cover crops. Now 55% of those acres were shoulder season cover crops and 45% were full season cover crops. And we also heard from a further 247 farmers that did not grow a cover crop in 2020 that took part. But as I say, we won't be discussing those results today. So let's look about at cover crop type by province. So what we've done, I've done here is uh, we're looking at the percentage of farm, uh, percentage of farmers which grew a shoulder season cover crop and the percentage of farmers that grew a full season cover crop by province. So as we can see across the three prairie provinces, the percentage of farmers in each province which is growing a full season cover crop is actually quite constant. Around 80% of farmers in each prairie province are growing a full season cover crop. But the percentage of farmers uh, as we go from the western provinces to the eastern provinces uh, increases as we go east. So um, Alberta has um, almost 40% of their farmers growing uh, a shoulder season cover crop, whereas um, roughly about 60%. So the majority of farmers who took part in our survey from Manitoba are growing a shoulder season cover crop. So if we look at the acres by province, uh, the last one was looking at the uh, percentage of respondents, we see that uh, once again, the acres of full season cover crops remain almost constant between the three um, prairie provinces, but the acres of shoulder season cover crop increase as we go west from Alberta into Saskatchewan and into Manitoba. There may be many reasons for this. Um, as I said earlier, Manitoba um, tends to have a bit more moisture availability in the fall, and many, re uh, many of the more southern regions of Manitoba do have um, bit of a longer growing season, which isn't always experienced in some of the regions of Alberta and Saskatchewan. So that might be some of the reasons for this trend. And now, so where are these farms located? So this was one of the major goals of our um, survey. So 37% of our farms that took part were from Manitoba, 32% of our farms were from Saskatchewan, and 31% of our farms were from Alberta. And we found that cover crops were being grown in just about every single region where there is agriculture across the prairies. So whether that be in um, the 
Red River Valley, down where I live, um, all the way into central and uh, northern and southern Saskatchewan, and into Alberta, even as far north as the extreme uh, northwest of the province in the Peace River Valley, we were finding cover crops being grown. So this is just to highlight that uh, cover crops are being grown in some form right the way across the prairies, um, whether they be different soil types, uh, different moisture availabilities in the fall. So farmers are innovating ways um, to grow cover crops on their farms. So how long have farmers been using cover crops? Well, uh, we've discovered that 82% of the farmers that took part in our survey have actually grown a cover crop before. Um, and the most common amount of time that farmers that took part in our survey um, was these farmers have been growing cover crops for three to five years. So 36% of farmers have been growing cover crops for three to five years. We did have 12% of farmers growing cover crops for more than a decade, but most farmers on the prairies are in the first few years of uh, adopting their cover crops. So who were these farmers that, uh, that are adopting cover crops and took part in our uh, survey? So the majority of farmers took part, 62% were actually livestock and uh, not shown in this graph because it's included in the livestock, but 54% of all farmers that took part who grew a cover crop had beef uh, cattle on their farm. 56% uh, of farmers that took part uh, identified as annual grain, 37% um, identified as regenerative, 32% said they had perennial crops and 26% of farmers said they're organic. Now I should just mention that met most of these questions we asked farmers, they could select all of the options which applied to them. So that's in case you're thinking this does not add up to 100%. But uh, as you can see here, the people growing cover crops are very diverse and represent many different types of farms. So what are the most common cover crop species? Uh, grown by the respondents uh, from our survey. So the most common cover crop was cl clovers, and they were grown by 57% of respondents. And there's many reasons why clover may be grown. It's uh, a seed which is often, it can be broadcast and it can be drilled. It has the ability to fix nitrogen, it can be grazed. Um, and then the next most common was oats, and that was grown by 52% of farmers. Um, but we also saw peas, hairy vetch, radish, rye grasses, many different, dozens of different types of species. Now of the top 15 species that were, uh, that we found in our uh, survey, five were annual grasses, four were legumes, and two were brassicas. And of these top 15, only three were warm season uh, cover crops. So most of them are cold season. So the only warm season we saw um, was millet, sunflower and buckwheat, and they were the 12th, 13th and 14th most common, common cover crops respectively. So on the prairies, definitely focused on cold season cover crops. So whenever we discuss cover crops, we need to think how can we actually fit them into our rotations? So it's a very important thing to ask is what cash crops were actually grown before the cover crops? Because this will um, really define what window we have to work with, with growing our cover crops. And the three most popular cash crops that came before our cover crops were all annual grains. So barley, which is 23% uh, uh, of farmers um, grew barley before their cover crop, 22% of farmers grew spring wheat before their cover crop, and 21% of farmers grew oats for their cover crops. But we also saw peas and canola pretty frequently. Um, you can see none there, and uh, there's many reasons why uh, that may be the case. Either they're growing after summer fallow, or maybe um, they grow a cover crop, a full season cover crop in the same place every year. But farmers were growing cover, uh, cover crops after dozens of different types of cash crops. So there really is opportunities out there um, on the prairies um, for growing cover crops after many different types of cover crop, uh, cash crops. 
So let's have a look at the um, number of species in our cover crop mixes. So what did we find out? Simple mixes uh, were more likely to be grown by farmers than complex mixes. 30% um, of farmers were growing a monocrop or cover crop, um, but we still saw a large number, um, a little bit more than 10% of farmers are actually growing a, a cover crop mix of more than 12 species. So we see a, 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 a large spread of um, different uh, uh, numbers of species in our cover crops on the prairies. So one uh, question we wanted to ask is how, are, uh, how is diversity of cover crops changing um, over time? We, we thought that, um, well, we hypothesized that um, farmers are, may uh, start with a simple mix of cover crops. And then um, as they become more comfortable uh, with uh, cover crops, they may choose to add more, uh, more species and increase the complexity of what they're doing, uh, which may take a bit of confidence. And it appears uh, this is uh, what's actually happening on the prairies. So 45% of farmers, if you add up, increase slightly and increase significantly, 45% of farmers increased the diversity of their cover crops over time. 27% of farmers did not change the diversity over time. Only 5% decreased the cover crop diversity over time. So it appears as farmers are becoming more confident with cover crops on the prairies, um, once they've started growing them, they're more likely to increase them over time than, than decrease them. So how are farmers actually planting these cover crops? So 49%, almost half of farmers are planting their cover crops with an air seeder. 37% are planting them with a seed drill. And interestingly, 26% of farmers are broadcasting them. We also saw 9% of farmers were using tillage in some form to uh, get that seed into the soil. And uh, then we also see some other interesting ways. There was a very, very small amount of farmers who were uh, using an airplane to plant their uh, cover crops on the prairies. So this is a question uh, which is very important to ask because how are farmers actually managing to get um, their uh, cover crops planted on the um, prairies? So um, we wanted to ask, uh, anyway, as we can see here on the left, the, um, almost 40% of farmers planted their cover crop instead of a cover crop, but we saw many farmers are actually starting their cover crops as an intercrop, either at cash crop planting, so a little over 35% are planting their cover crop at cash crop planting, or um, about 14% are planting their uh, cover crop uh, broadcast into their cash crop before harvest. So farmers, it appears on the prairies, the way that they are attempting to get round the uh, dryness in the fall, as well as the shortness of growing season, is they're starting their cover crops as a, an intercrop, which can really get around potentially some of that dryness in the fall and that shortness of the growing season. Um, so that we can try and get these cover crops established uh, when there's moisture and really add some of these extra, um, so we can really add uh, some of that ex those extra weeks in uh, getting uh, extra biomass on the prairies. So how are farmers terminating their crops? Well, the most common way to terminate their uh, cover crops on the prairies uh, from farms that took part in our survey is grazing. So I'm sure Manitoba Beef and Forages initiatives will be happy with that. Um, but we also saw winter kill being pretty popular with 37% uh, of farmers doing that. And tillage as well, 30% of farmers that took part um, used tillage. But uh, we also saw herbicide mowing, roller clumping, and then in some cases even using tarp or mulch, and that's more fruit and vegetable producers. So where are farms actually being able to source their cover crop seed? And this is an important question for uh, uh, you know, any farmer who wants to get started. So 
Even though more than half of farmers are sourcing their cover crop from a specialist seed retailer, um, a good proportion of farmers, 31% of farmers, are sourcing cover crops from another farmer, and 31% of farmers are actually growing their own seed. So um, farmers, as I say, are, they're really clearly forming these networks, and um, as I say, they're growing their own seed, but also getting it from a variety of sources. So something we really need to pay attention to is how much are farmers actually spending on cover crop seed. We found farmers are spending a huge spread <laughs> on uh, seed. Some farmers aren't paying for cover crop seed. and Some farmers are paying over $70 an acre. But most farmers we found are paying in the range between about $5 an acre for their cover crop seed up to about $30 an acre for their cover crop seed. But of course, this will depend on what farmers are, um, are uh, going to be growing, how complex their mix is, all these sort of things. So why are farmers growing cover crops on the prairies? And uh, this goes back into the goals, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, farmers choose their goals first and then they select cover crops to meet these goals. So this is why it's, a, it's very important to think why farms are actually growing cover crops, because this will affect what cover crops they choose to grow um, and the benefits that they'll end up seeing. So 80% of farmers told us they were growing cover crops to build soil health. Um, and the next most common reason they gave us 76% of farmers told us they were growing cover crops to increase soil organic matter. But also we saw uh, far many farmers are growing cover crops to keep living roots in the soil. And then that leads into the next most common reason to feed that soil biology when those microbes would be left hungry. But we also saw adding nitrogen, improving infiltration, increased biodiversity, weed suppression and grazing. So farmers on the prairies are growing cover crops. Um, to really try and achieve dozens of different goals. So here's something which uh, many people really want to find out is what benefits have farmers actually experienced? What, what benefits have farmers actually told us they have seen on their farm? So actually, 81% um, of farms that took part in our survey told us that they had seen at least one benefit from growing cover crops. So the majority of farmers are actually seeing benefits um, from growing cover crops. And the most common um, benefit um, was improved soil health, followed by increased biodiversity. Um, and then as well, we saw increased soil organic matter, less erosion and increased uh, infiltration. But as you can see, many, many different benefits uh, were observed um, on the prairies from growing cover crops by our growers. But uh, that's all well and good. How long did it actually take farms to see these benefits? Well, 71% of farmers actually told us that they saw benefits within the first three years of growing cover crops. So um, over 35% of farmers said they saw it in just one year. But if you add up year one, year two, year three, 71% of farmers told, that, told us they saw benefits within those first three years. Um, there are a number of farmers who said they haven't yet seen benefits, but many of those farmers had only been growing cover crop for maybe one or two years. So it appears farmers are seeing benefits from cover crops in some shape or form quite quickly. And we can't talk about cover crops on the prairies all these benefits without also addressing these uh, the many challenges which uh, can be experienced with cover crops. And this is something which was very important we asked because farmers, when they're considering growing cover crops, they need to know the challenges. And then that allows those farmers to really start innovating their ways around these many challenges they may face. And also allows researchers like myself, Dr. Von Lolly, to start thinking, how can we address these problems farmers are facing. So 87% of farmers that took part in our survey told us that they'd experienced problems while growing a cover crop um, over the 
number of years they grow on cover crops. Um, now, the most common uh, two, uh, two reasons were both down to our prairie climate, which is very much what we expected. Uh, like I said earlier, um, the most common reason experienced by 30% of our respondents was the shortness of the growing season, followed uh, by 27% um, by um, the lack of moisture in the fall for cover crop establishment. But we also saw other challenges such as additional costs, cover crops affecting the choice of herbicide farmers have available. We also saw cover crop failure or sparse cover crop, late harvest of cash crop preventing cover crop harvest, lack of equipment, maybe not enough support from uh, crop insurance, as well as the increased labor. But uh, definitely the two most commonly uh, common problems were both down to our climate. So here, here's a question which a lot of farmers uh, always ask me is, how are cover crops actually influencing our um, farm profits? So if we add up farmers that saw a moderate increase and farmers that saw a slight increase, 24% of farmers that uh, grew cover crops uh, who took part in our, our survey told us that they had seen an increase in their profit from growing cover crops. A further 24% told us they'd seen no change in their profit since they started growing cover crops. Only 4% of farmers said they saw a decrease from growing cover crops. Now, that may uh, seem very uh, like cover crops are having a positive effect on um, farm profits, but it is important to note that uh, that leaves um, just about half of all farmers that took part not being able to indicate uh, either saying that they didn't know the effect of cover crop uh, cover crops on their uh, profit maybe it varied year to year so they didn't know or it was just their first year of cover cropping so they didn't really they weren't sure of uh, cover crops effect on their profits so um, we may see this uh, change over time we can say that farmers that took part were more likely to see a benefit or no change than a decrease. But uh, until we see these farmers who are at the early stage saying they don't really know the effect, changing to giving us a definitive answer, we can't really say that cover crops are having a positive effect on profit. But they're certainly, from the farmers that took part, uh, telling us that they're more likely to see an increase in their profit than a decrease. So, how is cover cropping influencing tillage? Now, this is something which uh, is very important for us to gauge because tillage is associated with many negative uh, soil health effects. So it is uh, sometimes a fear that if we increase cover crops, we may increase the use of tillage because tillage is sometimes used as a way to terminate cover crops. So what we found uh, on the prairies is that uh, in 40% of the cases, tillage actually decreased with the use of, uh, with the adoption of cover crops. In 28% of cases, uh, it stayed the same. Well, uh, there is uh, only 10% of um, farmers which, uh, um, took took part, actually increased uh, their uses of tillage. So this seems quite a positive indication that uh, cover cropping on the prairies doesn't appear to be increasing uh, tillage, which is uh, a great result. So this is uh, one of the questions we asked as well is um, the change in cover crop acres over time. Now this is a great um, question to really gauge. Do farmers believe cover crops um, have a long-term place on their farm because you're only going to increase acres of cover crops if you are confident in their role on your farm uh, and again you're if you don't change again you're going to be confident you're only going to decrease it or, or stop growing altogether if uh, you're not uh, uh, too happy. So 
anyway, 51% of farmers um, told us that they increased their use of cover crops uh, over time. So just over half told us that they were, they increased their cover crop acres over time. 19% said they didn't change their cover crops, uh, the number of acres they've grown. Only 2% of farmers told us that they'd actually decreased their cover crop use over time. So this I see is um, a firm indication that at least the farmers that took part in our survey um, are confident in their use of uh, cover crops on their farm. So enabling cover crop use, how did these farmers who took part tell us that, uh, you know, what measures uh, that could be taken uh, may enable cover crop use? So farmers, uh, I chiefly identified uh, financial incentives would uh, uh, make them more likely to, to grow cover crops. So the most uh, common uh, measure that they identified was payments for storing carbon, which was identified by 59% of people who took part in our survey, followed by tax credits for planting cover crops, which 55% uh, of farmers uh, identified that measure as uh, helping possibly to enable them growing cover crops. And then similarly, 38% of farmers told us that payments from a conservation group or watershed district would uh, be helpful to them. But we also saw a number of farmers really wanting uh, things like information, technical assistance with planting cover crops, greater access to information and scientific data and use. And that just really shows us again that we're at such a uh, level on our, uh, of growing cover crops in the prairies that we really need uh, this more information and things like this so that we can actually um, create uh, some more information on how farmers can uh, grow cover crops on the prairies. So this was just a very brief overview of my report. My report can be accessed uh, on, uh, on our website, um, but it's, it's free to use, it's out there. And um, I encourage everyone to, uh, to have a read of that report, which will go in a bit more in depth, but this is just the beginning of our our work. We hope uh, we will, over the years, we will continue to um, research cover crops. We'd, I'd really like to thank our funders, General Mills and Manitoba Agriculture, and especially I'd like to thank Manitoba Beef and Forages Initiatives for hosting this webinar. And I'd like to welcome uh, anyone who has a question. Uh, for myself and uh, Dr. Yvonne Lawley, my professor, um, to write that question in the Q&A, which is uh, next to the chat. Um, and we will try and answer as many as we have time for. And uh, I thank you very much for attending and hope that uh, you've learned something about uh, um, cover cropping on the Canadian prairies. Great, Callum, you can hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Virginia. Perfect. So we're going to start with an easy one, but I think it's a very essential question. What, how do you define shoulder season or how did you define it, define it in your uh, survey? Mm -hmm. So for us, it was very much down to the intent that uh, is a farmer growing cover crops to protect the soil in that season between two, um, between one cash crop and the next. So that means we, we did allow farmers to have, as I said, started a cover crop as an intercrop. But if, the primer, if it was grown to, provide, to protect that time period and there was a cash crop grown before it in the same growing season, it was a uh, shoulder season cover crop. And um, uh, I don't know if Yvonne wants to add anything to that. I think you got it, Callum. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fantastic. But for the most part, farmers um, were able to identify correctly what uh whether they grew a shoulder or a full season cover crop they they knew what they were doing for the most part i think one thing that's interesting about cover crops on the prairies right now is just terminology and like what we call these things is um it's kind of i think in in flux right now in development you know in manitoba we hear terms like polycrop um certainly green manures is something we've heard for a long time from organic growers. Um, and obviously there's 
a lot of overlap with, you know, annual forages with cover crops with the way we're using them on the prairies that maybe don't exist in, in other parts of Canada or in the United States. And then to, um, you know, we had someone type in the chat this evening about winter cereals and how to, you know, shoulder mm -hmm. season cover crops. Are they the same thing as winter cereals? And, and so I think it's an exciting time of innovation right now. And we've got these ideas from other places and we're developing strategies that are going to work for us here on the prairie. So I don't get too worried about what we call them right now. We just had to call them something <laughs> for the survey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it seems like uh, the people that participated in the survey were, were able to sort out uh, where their cover crops fit. Mm -hmm. And another question related to the survey questions is you um, grouped clovers together, but what mm -hmm. were common clover species that were grown? Wish we'd uh, asked that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's something we wish we asked. And when we designed, we actually designed another survey specifically for Ontario, we broke the clovers down. So it's difficult for us to say because we didn't break up the clovers, it's difficult for us to really, I don't really want to guess what that they would be, because that's the thing. There's been several, you know, small and some larger surprises on what farmers are doing. So uh, sometimes it's better to hear from the farmers directly as to what they're doing rather than us taking guesses. But yeah, uh, I guess you know, if anyone's here and wants to and growing cover crops, if they want to put in the chat what kind mm -hmm. of clovers they're using, that might help us mm -hmm. crowd answer this question. Yeah, but uh, the, um, the Ontario farmers are definitely going to benefit from knowing <laughs> what types of clovers they have. Yeah. Great. And we have quite a few questions, um, unsurprisingly, about it being so dry. So I'll mm -hmm. ask um, this one particular question. Uh, what are your thoughts on farmers getting into cover cropping this year for the first time? Do you think there's a right time to start? And what might those ideal conditions look like in a semi-arid environment? Ooh, that's a great question. Yeah, that's a good question. I think Paige put that question in. Paige is working <laughs> at the University of Saskatchewan. Um, uh, gee, that's a hard question, Paige. You know, it was really dry here in Manitoba this year, and even for our own research plots, even for our on-farm research, I didn't think we were going to have cover crops growing this fall. And then things turned around. It started raining at the end of the growing season, and the cover crop seed that we put in grew. Now, you know, we're not out of this drought yet. And I don't think, I don't think we know yet until the snow flies and we see how much snow we get, whether using water this fall is going to help or, or hurt us. I think one thing that I would say in answering this question is, you know, what's your goal? <laughs> Maybe I sound like a broken record there. <laughs> and so um, if you've got long-term goals, uh, you have to find a way to work towards those, right? And maybe this year wasn't the right year to start because it was dry and there was, there's not enough water in some parts to go around for the cash crops, let alone growing mm -hmm. cover crops. Um, but on the other hand, we have to start sometime. So I, mm -hmm. think, I think you have to take a look at your rotation and how water demanding the next crop is. Um, I think you also need to think about where that best spot is in your rotation to start. Um, and uh, I know for, for some of the low residue crops this year, that might be a place where it is worthwhile growing a cover crop because if you don't have a lot of residue to trap snow this year, and that's an important goal come spring to have moisture from snow, you know, maybe that cover crop is going to, to help more than it hinders. You know, um, we, Callum actually spent a lot of time measuring soil moisture in some of our uh, mm -hmm. research plots this year. And I'm really hoping that some of the data he collected this year and will continue with next year will help answer some of these questions that are, are really hard calls um, at this point. So, um, Gee, Callum, I don't know if you have anything to add there. I think yeah. it's like the impossible question right now. I, I think you, you did very well. I think that, um, as you said, some year, you know, perhaps this wasn't the best year to start. <laughs> I almost certainly it was more difficult than most. And that's the thing, the problem with moisture is, you know, 
but our hope is that long term we will be building soils which are more resilient to these long term changes we're going to be seeing on the prairies that uh, hopefully we will build soils which are more likely to you know better prepared to allow so um, water infiltration and increase that soil organic matter and the ability for these soils to hold on to moisture. So that's a long term benefit. But in the short term, when we see such a dry fall, you know, that that's, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be very difficult. Real trail. I think, you know, one other thing I'd say about starting off is to start small, you know, mm -hmm. um, to start with a strip, to start with an area and you know, it would be great if it's not your most challenging soil. I mean, maybe that's your goal to really focus on those challenging soils. But if you want to really see how cover crops can perform, you know, put them in a representative area. Um, mm -hmm. But, but you know, what? Start with something that's manageable for you. And mm -hmm. you know, some people, some people are big acre people, and so they start with big acres. But mm -hmm. um, start with something that's manageable for you. And yeah. uh, and so that way, if you you try mm -hmm. it out in a dry year or a wet year. Um, you learn something from from that year. I mean, I guess that's what I do as a researcher, and and, mm. uh, and I value um, the experiences that I hear from farmers that tell me about th what they're learning um, mm. as they do on on their farms. So, and that's exactly what we found. Uh, uh, we didn't include it today because we didn't have enough time. But uh, in our report, we asked farmers, you know, what percentage of uh, your total farm acres are you devoting to cover crops and uh, it appears most farmers are only growing cover crops in a small number of their acres. So perhaps on the prairies very early on, you know, they're, they're only growing cover crops on those small acres, maybe trying it out. And as we saw, farmers are, you know, pretty much uh, increasing their acres over time, almost, um, well, in 51% uh, um, in of cases, <laughs> they're uh, increasing over time. So it appears a lot of farmers are trialing it and increasing as they see what's happening. So what Yvonne's saying seems to be backed up by, uh, by our results, so. Any other questions we should get to Virginia? Yeah, another common uh, theme was what online communities, forums, or social media pages <laughs> would you recommend uh, looking into to connect with um, cover croppers or intercropping farmers? Those oh. are great questions. I mean, uh, Lana Shaw is on the webinar tonight, and I would say she's a great person mm -hmm. to connect with um, on social media, and she can help you uh, connect through the people that are interacting with her, certainly on intercropping, but Lana's also, you know, um, doing trials on cover crops. She's got one of our uh, rotation studies at her site in Redverse. Um, I think here in Manitoba, we have some grazing clubs. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Mary Jane might be able to help us there in terms of who the best person is to contact, whether it's Michael Teeley. Um, I would love if there's someone here on the on the webinar tonight to put in the chat who you think, you know, a good network um, is. And maybe if you put what area you're in or where you think that what area of the prairies you think that network is connected mm -hmm. with it would probably help those. Maybe that's our next research question or... Um, <laughs> Hopefully, you know, this survey will uh, help organizations that are really good at hosting networks. Um, like in Manitoba, we've got watershed districts. Maybe this will enable some of these communities to form. I think um, a few of the feedbacks we've had, a few of the written feedbacks that Callum's gotten have really um, touched on how lonely it feels sometimes mm -hmm. to be an innovator in your area. And uh, I would really love for this project to be a springboard for mm -hmm. farmers and those that are interested in learning to get connected. So I hope that plays out. And there's a suggestion in the chat for a Facebook group for Western Canadian cover. So I think that is a marvelous. I, I think we need that. And uh, we've, we've, we find that in other places, you'll see there's cover crop groups for other other regions, you know, whether that be, you know, Iowa, Illinois, we could really do with a Western uh, Canadian Facebook group. Maybe I should start one. I mean, <laughs> it should be farmer led, <laughs> you know, definitely. But, uh, you know, maybe I should start one after this uh, because 
Farmers, as we've seen from the survey, they want to share their stories. Many of these early adopters are feeling lonely and, well, I don't mean feeling lonely, but I mean, uh, they, I'm just saying they, they want to learn from other farmers. They have that appetite to learn from farmers and they have that appetite to share. You know, they're innovators and, you know, innovators work far better when they're working together. And, you know, we, we really, really need to, uh, to form that. So I, I think... I think there's an appetite for that. And we could very quickly, you know, there's 166 people still watching, you know, <laughs> how many of them could be members? You know, it's, I think this would be a good, good, uh, good idea. Great. Are there any current or planned studies to measure financial or soil climate benefits from cover crops? I think they're definitely coming. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I wanted to start working on cover crops 10 years ago, it was a real hard sell. Um, but the but the funds are are starting to open up, and um, you know uh, cover crops are getting into programs like you know Ag Canada's um, Living Labs now, and um, one of my students, Dale Penner, he's collaborating now with uh, an economist who's working through the Living Labs. So I'm hoping that we'll have some data in the next year, either through the on-farm experiments that are happening in Manitoba. Um, that really focus on the economics um, of, of cover crops. You know, I think one of the challenges we have right now is cover crops are still, we're still in this early adoption phase. So like the environmental benefits, um, the economic long run costs, like we just, we're not, we need to accumulate years to, to look at it through many environments. So hopefully the data, the initial data will come up the short and medium term. Um, but we have to keep working a little bit longer mm -hmm. to get sort of the long-term impacts. Um, some of the research that we've started um, with funding from Western Grains Research Foundation um, that's hosted at the University of Manitoba with me and Kate Congreves and Rich Farrell, oh, and Mario Tenuta here at U of M, we're looking at greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and I'd love to start looking at, you know, things like water budgets and, and how that influences um, like how much water we can get into the soil or how much how um, cover crops influence spring runoff, things like that. But I think all these, all the collaborators are interested and it's just a matter of getting all of our proposals and ducks and funders in a row to, to make that happen. So I'm optimistic mm -hmm. that we'll have these numbers in the next five to 10 years for the prairies. And then speaking of the numbers, are you able to share the Ontario data and is there a timeline for that? Ooh. Well, it's Callum just sent me the first draft report. <laughs> so it's coming and, uh, and we'll likely be having a webinar um, mm -hmm. with Green Farmers Ontario for the Ontario survey. So stay mm -hmm. tuned. It will be coming. Yes. <laughs> and very, very different situation in Ontario. Yeah, um, you know, it's so interesting to learn how you can take the same practice, just move one province over and everything changes. So mm -hmm. it'll be it'll be exciting to share that report um, mm -hmm. with the community in Ontario and the community across Canada. I think it'll really help um, policymakers see how we need flexibility in whatever programs are being designed because the way we're going to do cover crops is going to needs to be region specific and farm specific. Um, are there disease issues with growing cover crops? Are any cover crops hosts of important diseases in Western Canada? And I guess, did you hear from respondents about that? Great question. Well, we know that they are hosts, right? Like, a lot of these crops that we're growing as cover crops, like if Callum goes back to his, you know, what <laughs> cover crops do we plant slide? A lot of them are, you know, cash crops that, mm -hmm. that we have grown or do grow in the prairie. So yeah, all plants are going to host diseases. And, and I think that that's something we were looking for in the survey. Um, I mean, sure, if we get some pathologists working on this, we're going to find troubles, um, some trouble areas with diseases. And I'm sure that there are things that we need to adapt to make these systems work uh, for the prairies. Because our crop rotation here is very different than, you know, areas in the U.S. or even in Ontario where corn and soybeans are the major crops in rotation. And, you know, things like 
canola and brassicas add diversity because you know they only have majorly corn and soybeans in the rotation so yeah we we do I, have to be smart i thought it would have reached the top 15 pests and diseases but i can't see it there so it looks like it didn't even reach the top 15 yeah so, so it didn't it didn't show up there yet and you know part of that could be where we are on the adoption curve at this point that we're dealing with early adoption so you know it takes a few years for things to grow but i think um again what was that? there was a virus uh, do you remember a bomb? Oh, we were talking about 48? one of the challenges that we had in yes. 2019 in our research plots uh, with barley yellow dwarf coming in um, because we had planted uh, fall rye in between the alleys in our experiments. So we had a green bridge and, uh, and our wheat the next year had barley yellow dwarf. So yeah, there are issues that mm -hmm. we're going to have to navigate with both shoulder season and full season cover crops but I don't think that those are insurmountable challenges mm -hmm. for us to adopt and it might mean too that we need to select and find species that are going to plant species that are going to bring us that diversity that we need um, on the prairies um, that will complement our rotations we we may not be able to use the species um, from other areas where they're, you know, like the radishes are a great example. And I did my whole PhD on radishes. I, I really think that they're a great cover crop, but, you know, in a canola growing area, you know, they're going to bring uh, greater risks, greater challenges, you know, with flea beetles, they'll eat radishes. So um, mm -hmm. Virginia can, or Virginia can talk about the challenges of, <laughs> Trying mm -hmm. to find radishes in the, some of the plots we have whenever we swath canola, you know. My arch nemesis mm -hmm. is the flea beetle. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so great question about um, diseases, and uh, they're certainly there. And I'm looking forward to collaborating with some pathologists if and when they're ready to look at these questions. So it's after nine, but we did start a little late. Do we want to ask? Uh, I'll ask a couple more questions here. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy with that. We still have 160 participants, so it seems people are still interested. So, Great. Yeah. so the it's green, so this is, a, this is a question for the grain farmers. When a farmer doesn't have livestock, um, do you have suggestions? Like how, where they would start? Great question. You know, um, I think that uh, that's really important. If we're going to uh, increase the acreage of cover crops on the prairies, we've got to find um, cover cropping strategies that are compatible with uh, our, our grain rotations that fit into some tight windows or tighter windows um, and also are compatible with the herbicides that we use um, with our grain crops. So um, I think for starting out in a, in a grain farming situation, I'm, I'm going to turn to what we're experiencing in our on-farm experiments. So we have we have um, some, you know, small plot rotation studies um, across the prairies that, I, that I've brought up. But we also in Manitoba, we have five uh, farms that are collaborating with us to do replicated strips um, in, within their rotation. So, you know, whatever crops they're going to grow, uh, we try and find a cover crop that to, to follow um, in replicated strips across their farm. So, what, I'm, what I've experienced so far with those farmers is, you know, we tend to be alternating cereal crops and then a broadleaf crop. And it seems like the cereal years um, are where we have the best success in getting some cover crop growth. Um, you know, where we're growing canola, especially the longer season canolas um, or soybeans, we just don't have a, a long window. And maybe that, that's also lined up mm -hmm. with some dry falls for us in, in these past three years. So. Um, I would recommend from our on-farm experience so far mm -hmm. to start with a cereal crop. And I think that matches really well what Callum found in his survey data that we're mm -hmm. seeing with those cereals um, being very popular yeah. previous crops to cover crops. Barley, yeah. spring wheat and oats. Barley, so, spring wheat and oats. The and the other thing that uh, I would say both starting out in a cereal um, or in a grain only situation is 
to count on volunteers because I think that's also something mm -hmm. we saw in the on farm experiments, even in our no cover crop uh, plots, we had volunteers. Um, and so you can think about augmenting whatever crop you're expecting to volunteer in the fall. So, um, you know, if you have a cereal crop, then maybe you want to put some clover seed down um, to go with it. And you can decide whether that's a clover like red clover that's going to overwinter or maybe a clover like crimson clover that's, you know, for a much longer, uh, warmer place than we are here. So we know it's going to winter kill uh, reliably um, and bring some diversity that way. Um, what else, Callum? What am I missing? What do we know from our survey data about uh, where to start in cereal rotations or green, green systems? Well, one thing which uh, someone had just mentioned in the chat, which did come up, a, I mean, I did see a few people telling me in this uh, survey, and we didn't specifically ask about it, but farmers were asked to tell us what they're doing. And a number of farmers told us that they were a, gr a grain farmer, they didn't have livestock on their farm, but they were working with their neighbours who did have livestock. So they could still get some of the benefits for grazing and then the benefits that integrating livestock into your system can have by uh, forming partnerships with their neighbours. So um, that's, that's one thing which uh, can be an idea out there. But uh, I think, again, you hit the nail on the head that, you know, some of the most the most common, uh, as I say, cash crops that followed cover crops and some of them which, uh, and the cash crops which uh, potentially have the biggest windows and greatest opportunities are uh, annual grain crops. So I think there are a lot of opportunities for farmers who are solely um, cash croppers. Uh, um, so I, I think there's, uh, there's still opportunities for them and, uh, you know, it's just finding what works for them. and. Uh, uh, yeah. Virginia and I are working on a fact sheet right now, and uh, <laughs> maybe that'll be out in a few months. But um, I guess the other thing I'm thinking about while I'm sitting here is I think for grain farmers, it's really important to think about what your goal is um, because you're not going to get that, you know, immediate value from the, the cover crop as a feed, um, like the crop livestock farmers do. Um, so I think if erosion is really important to you, if you're concerned about soils blowing in an open winter, like we've had at least in Manitoba, Southern Manitoba for the last few winters um, with limited snow cover, then, you know, I think looking for some of those short-term um, coupled with medium and long-term building uh, goals are, are important um, where you can see value in, in the short run. Um, if, things turn around here and it gets wet again, you know, um, having something that overwinters, um, like winter cereals that maybe gives you some transpiration to dry soils in the spring or gives you better trafficability in the spring. Like those are things that are very quantifiable um, even in the short term um, uh, use of cover crops. I think too, like as we, <laughs> are going to have more and more challenges with herbicide resistant weeds. I think that's another mm -hmm. place where um, if we can get a handle on cover crops before some of those problem weeds show up, um, we'll be able to see some immediate benefits, uh, even in grain only systems. So a question, what else have you got for us, Virginia? Question <laughs> that I think it's important to ask in a big audience, has a list been compiled of cover crop seed suppliers? For example, I have very difficult time finding buckwheat. That's a great question. And Virginia, you and I have been working on this fact sheet and that sort of came up there too, is we really don't ha have a great list for, for the prairies of who's got seed. And I think that landscape is changing too, um, mm -hmm. at least with what I've experienced in Manitoba over the last three or four years is um, more local dealers are starting to move some cover crop seed or, um, you know, like barley and oats are also grain crops, but maybe they're not grown in all areas. So I, um, what I'm seeing, what I thought I saw in the survey results that Callum shared with or shared with you about where they're getting their cover crop seed is there's a lot of farm to farm trading that's going on mm -hmm. as well as um, finding um, 
seed from local seed sellers. So in addition to Callum's Facebook group <laughs> <laughs> for cover crops on the prairies, we'll have to we'll have to find a way to compile a list of where you can find seed. Looks like some people are sharing already in the chat where they're, <laughs> yeah. where they're finding seed. So that's great. And then we had a couple questions from um, farmers on sandy or like loamy sand soil mm -hmm. and recommendations on species or management. Mm -hmm. Well, those sandy soils are are important, right? Like they they can they can blow, they can be open, and mm -hmm. um, I think. If I can just speak to where we are in Manitoba right now, um, you know, some of the work that Virginia's done and her agronomy work looking at rye termination timings really came out of the early work I saw with farmers who were um, on sandy soils that needed to cover them. And so I think a great place to start with those sandy soils is rye, but you may mm -hmm. want to terminate it um, you know, not let it get too big to start. So maybe terminate it when it's six inches or half a foot tall. And, uh, and also maybe start, make sure that you're terminating two weeks ahead of planting, um, which when we're working with legume crops from like soybeans in Virginia's experiment, um, don't seem to be hurt by rye. I think rye ahead of cereal crops is not a great idea just because it's going to be um it's going to be those are early season nitrogen demanders even canola um so so picking where it goes in your rotation and then thinking about when you need that cover for those sandy soils um if you are thinking about you know moisture stress because we're in this dry time so we're thinking about having not enough water i think termination timing or picking something that um like oats or barley that grow really well in the fall and then winter kill and then planting directly into that residue is another great way of creating residue um, and then just leaving it there for the springtime. So again, talking about lists that we need, um, what is a good source to investigate incentives? Ooh. We would love for those. <laughs> those policy uh, groups to come forward and start talking with us about that. I mean, I think that um, I've had a lot of inquiries with, you know, companies that want to talk about, you know, having sustainably sourced ingredients that are interested in cover crops, um, you know, the emergence of carbon markets. I think cover crops mm -hmm. could be a player in all these. It's just, it's just early days. So yeah. I don't think there is a one-stop shop to answer those kinds of incentive questions, but I'm hoping that this survey will come a long way in providing some information to farmers and mm -hmm. to these other interested parties so that we mm -hmm. can move this conversation along. Yeah, I think, I think Yvonne's right. There's many opportunities there, and we've shown that uh, different measures, you know, in some form would be, you know, possible but the difficulty is as, as we've shown that um, it's so different everywhere and farmers are going cover crops for so many different re reasons so any incentive program would have to take all that into account so it's not something which uh, you know it, it's something that will have to be really thought out and uh, really based on what the farmers are actually doing and uh, you know this is why this is the beginning. <laughs> this is nowhere near the end. It's like to quote Churchill, this this uh, is only the end of the beginning. It's, uh, <laughs> it's not even the beginning of the end. So, you know. I can see some, you know, discussion coming through in the chat, how there are some uh, conservation districts, watershed districts that are starting these programs. So I think this is a, a really great start and hopefully, um, you know, we can we can use those Churchillian phrases to say we were here when. <laughs> yeah. Well, Virginia, are we kind of through questions? Should we should we wrap things up here? It's 915. Yes. Do we want to end off with the complicated question? Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> the one everyone asks. 
Uh, does any legume seeded in early August fix nitrogen, even if it germinates soon after seeding? What amount of nitrogen can we expect to get fixed from that August 15th to freeze up? Great research question. <laughs> You know, right now in my experiments, I am measuring, like in Virginia, you have been the one out collecting this data. So we measure, you know, biomass accumulation, how much nitrogen is in that biomass and what the carbon to nitrogen ratio is. But I've never actually measured, you know, active nitrogen fixation in those crops. So those are great questions. Great. We'll leave them on a cliffhanger then. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much to everyone that joined us this evening and uh, we're looking forward to connecting with you again in the in the future and thank you to MBFI for hosting us this evening. Thank you so much. It's uh, for everything and everyone who's uh, taken part and everyone who's uh, who's come along today that uh, you know it, it's really been a fantastic journey and uh, we want to keep this going, so fantastic. Thank you, Callum and Yvonne. Um, one last plug as people are logging off is just, I'm gonna screen share a promo. So a lot of questions have come up and we might have an opportunity at MBFI to do on-farm demonstration. So just to put this here, you've all been through our website. Um, you can go back to their website and click on project ideas and give us your feedback on what you would really like to see as either a part of, uh, maybe we can work with Yvonne and try and figure something out in the future to try and do some farm scale work or what we can do in just our own on-farm demonstration um, to do different uh, cover cropping uh, scenarios, which will all end up being grazed um, given us being, uh, have cows that everything we grow goes through a cow. So thank you again, uh, Callum, for your fantastic work and for Yvonne, um, for your fantastic work in mentoring these young professionals coming into the egg industry and going forward. Um, and thank you, we have been recording this session and so we will uh, get it posted onto our YouTube website and everyone that has registered will receive uh, a link as well as it'll be publicly promoted as well. So thank you very much. <laughs>